Uh, chair is here. Adam Sokolowski is here. Yes, here. Robert Hitt Decker is here. Yes. And Alex Hershenretter. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Good evening, uh, Mr. Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are you still waiting for a board member? No, we're going to open because we've got a we've got a quorum. Well, I'm uh, from the applicant's viewpoint. I'm interested in having a full board so that there's a full complement to vote on the petition. We we have five. As long as you have. You only have four, Bernie. Well, I'm sorry. We only have four. You're right. I got to change that list. So you want to recess for five minutes and wait for Mr. Staberski or Mr. Yeah, let's wait. Let's recess for five minutes. See if we can pick one more person. Oh, John's here. Okay, so John, you're here. Yeah, I was actually on uh, on the public site, so I wasn't appearing on the screen and I couldn't talk, so I had to okay. go back and do a read. Okay, uh, Attorney Donahue, uh, we have a full quorum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, members, um, I thought what we do tonight is uh, you're going to address us with some more information, I take it or not. Uh, we'll have the board ask uh, some questions and discuss the material that you give us tonight. We're going to have uh, 45 minutes for public comments, three minutes each, and no repeats. And we're going to end it at that, all right? And we'll go from there. Are you all set? The only thing I'd ask, uh, Mr. Chairman, is for your indulgence to be able to make a closing statement at the end of the public comment before you close the hearing. Okay. Uh, I don't know we're going to close the hearing tonight or not, but we'll see. We'll go from there, all right? But well, we certainly give you time for a closing statement. Thank you. Well, Bernie, if they got nothing and anybody from the public that wants to speak, let's start it. I mean, uh, well, I'm not sure, uh, Mark, you have something that you want any, any new information just, for us? He just said he wanted to go at the end of the public comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, no, I, I, it, it was just as the lineup um, uh, that I just wanted to, to make that point. Um, at, at the end of the last meeting um, uh, of the board on September 10th, um, we actually asked uh, and, and tried to get some direction from the board as to the additional information that you are looking for. Uh, and what, what we received or took away from that uh, was um, three particular categories. One was in, uh, a question with regard to further advancement uh, of the discussions and the issuance of permits with MassDOT. And so with your permission, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna turn that over to either Mr. Kelly or Mr. Brubaker. Uh, to bring you up to date as to where we stand in that process. Okay, so recognized. <clears throat> I can take that chat if you'd like. Yes, please. Uh, so we, we did get some. Uh, you know, John, give us your name because when we go to, when the, the scribe goes to write this out, we have to know who's speaking for our minutes, I, please. Thank I apologize, you. Mr. Chair. Uh, again, Sean Kelly with the NASA Associates, the traffic engineers in the project. Uh, we have made a, a, you know, a final submittal to MassDOT. There was some some minor comments um, relative to the design plans that we presented to you at the last meeting. Um, they're very minor, you know, extension of some, some uh, turn lanes and, and, and paper markings by, you know, 20 feet. It was no, it's essentially the same plan you've seen before, but there were some, some very minor comments they wanted addressed. We, we did also um, understand that there has been a, um, another crash at this location that occurred last week. Um, we, you know, we looked at what occurred down there and I, I believe um, one of the members of the board actually was the was the officer on duty there, but there was a collision where a, a motorist was you know traveling down Mill Village Road, um, didn't stop at the proper location and actually pulled into Route Five and Ten and was struck by a motorcyclist um, traveling in the southbound direction. Um, it was unfortunate. My understanding is the you know, that motorist was cited because um, they didn't adhere to the to the rules of the road. They didn't um, give right away to the the motorist on Five and Ten who had the right of way. I will only note that. Um, you know, part of our plan, one of the things that we noticed is that the star bars that exist on both the Mill Village Road and uh, the Main Street approaches there are, are fairly worn out. There isn't a whole lot of paint there, and it's really tough to tell where to stop if you're not familiar with the road. So, you know, we, we certainly understand, and, you know, we, it's awful that there was another collision, but uh, the plan that we put out 
uh, ultimately provide some of some remedy to some of these you know issues that exist and, and we think it again uh, it's, it's under review by DOT we think it'll, it'll ultimately result in a safer intersection um, under future conditions so we're waiting we expect we'll hopefully have that permit in hand you know um, perhaps even as early as next week but um, but it is at DOT under review right now thank you um, I guess board any questions on that yeah, just a point of record, uh, I was not working then and I was not the investigating officer. And I just did give the press statement that case was approved by the chief. Gotcha. Okay, that was Adam Sokolowski. Okay, um, Mr. Dunn, are you anything else that uh, you, you said three points you were gonna address? That's the first one, I take it? That, that was the first question that we have that we were asked by the board, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the second was an issue raised, uh, I think during the course of public comment and that was whether the project requires review by NEPA. Um, NEPA is a state agency that is a predicate to state action, um, the issuance of a state permit. It is truly irrelevant uh, to a local special permit, uh, but it was asked by a board member, so we did uh, take a second look. The traffic being generated by the site uh, does not meet any of the thresholds required uh, for the limited state action that's involved here. The limited state action is a curb cut or an access permit from MassDOT to create the driveway. The anticipated traffic as uh, demonstrated by Mr. Kelly's work does not trigger any of those review thresholds and therefore the project is not jurisdictionally within uh, the grounds of NEPA. Um, the third really goes to the issue of what are the benefits of the site we try to put some of that in writing to the board, and we can certainly go over that in more detail after the public comment. Okay. Uh, board, did everyone get the comments from, <coughs> from uh, have, John, you get yours? I did. Uh, I just have one question on that, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yep. John Zabersky, go ahead. Uh, so Attorney Donahue, um, uh, I saw your letter and I read it and I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, is there anything in addition to what's on that, um, what's in your letter that you would consider a benefit or is that your uh, total uh, presentation on the benefits of, uh, of the proposal? Well, I, I think it'd be fair to say that I could say much more on each one of the benefits, but I think those are the categories of benefits and for the uh, the benefit of brevity. Um, I didn't try to tr um, go through them in any greater detail, um, but I think those are the general categories as far as the benefits. And I think even more importantly, uh, what they are is the uh, distillation uh, from our review of all the public record as to what's been said for the perceived drawbacks or detriments that have been asserted during the course of the public hearing process. Well, Mr. Donnie, to be specific, the reason why I asked that question is we're gonna weigh the benefits against the detriments to decide whether we think a special permit is warranted to have a larger building than is authorized by our bylaws. Uh, and I wanted just to make sure that when we're evaluating uh, the proposal, those are the benefits that we're gonna be looking at as opposed to the detriments. And, and I mean, it, I can understand that they're not as voluminous as they could be, but those are the, at least the checklist of benefits we should, we should have in mind when we're evaluating your proposal. Well, two things, if I might, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, first of all, you're, uh, just to correct, uh, the building is not larger than is allowed by the bylaw. The building is actually much smaller than is permitted upon the issuance of a special permit by the bylaw. What it does exceed is the as of right use uh, of a building. Um, but it, the building is in compliance with the requirements of the bylaw and therefore properly before you for a special permit. Uh, and what we try to do is to still what I believe is now close to 12 hours of public testimony on this matter, including our testimony into that letter. Uh, so as I said, I think it hits the categories of uh, the benefits, but I, I'm sure that we have stated others during the course of the hearing uh, and the board can take all of that into consideration in its deliberation. Thank you. You, Thank you, you, co you covered all three then, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other board members questions on those? Um, uh, was there eight criteria you gave us? Uh, Nine. Sorry. 
Yes. I think, I think David's looking to be recognized, and I see him in two different viewpoints on the screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to let Bernie know I've been here. I've been listening. I'm, I'm, I'm present. I'm logging in on my second device. Okay, so I'm gonna. So Jennifer Checkham is in now. Thank you. Any other questions? Just have one little correction, Bernie. Yes. In on the first page of Mr. Donahue's letter, under one that would benefits, uh, it says far less cold. I think it should say could. I think it's just a typo. That's accurate, and I I appreciate the uh, the close reading and the the editing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Decker. Uh, any anyone else? Okay, so let's move to the next step, which is going to be um, open for public comments. We're going to allow forty-five minutes, uh, three minutes for each person, and we're going to ask if there's no repeats. Jen, I'm going to leave that up to you to figure out uh, who's got their hand into this to be recognized. And I ask that the people please state your name and address for the public record. Okay, Tolly. Thank you. Tolly. Yeah, go ahead. You can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. My name is Tolly Stark, 121 Keats Road. I uh, just want to say good evening to everyone. Good evening to all the ZBA members. And I would like to share with you this evening um, some very important town history. And I hope that you will take this into consideration when you deliberate on the special permit application. In 2010, nearly unanimously to limit buildings to 4,000 square feet. That vote was done very intentionally. It followed years of the master planning process, including multiple meetings and a collaborative process of town officials, citizens, regional planners, historians, and others. The master planning process proved very definitively that almost unanimously Deerfield residents want our town to be scenic, agricultural, farm friendly, and to retain its predominantly rural character. Zoning relief of this kind was intended to be there as an option for a truly great development that would bring exponential benefits to our community. This applicant simply does not fit that criteria, bringing many more detriments instead. This would be a variety store, and we have variety stores in Deerfield now. We can also drive as little as 4.3 miles to be at the same exact variety store. Over 700 Deerfield residents are asking this board to please uphold the town's years of careful planning, to honor the many resources the town has put into developing this planning, and to uphold the town's nearly unanimous vote to limit buildings to 4,000 square feet. Thank you all for listening and thank you for your time this evening. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, Jennifer, anyone else? Yes, uh, one moment. Let me just give me a minute. Okay, we have Lori. Hi, I, I hold on, Lori. I'm making you a participant so you can be seen. Uh, okay. Okay, there you go. 
So I, I did send in a letter, but I just wanted to state it for the record tonight. Um, we have on that same stretch of road, an empty shell of a building that has lots of parking and it's not at an intersection. So if the major benefit that the developer is suggesting is to provide um, discount products, even though as many people have stated, we don't want to supersede our local business person, uh, people here in town. But if that is the goal and the benefit, then there are better places to locate such a store. And not on a, a busy intersection that is the gateway to historic Deerfield and to a road that has hundreds, I don't have the number in my head, hundreds of acres protected under the agricultural preservation restriction law. So I'm referring specifically to the Volvo building and the Gables building across the street on Route 5. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Jennifer? Hi, one second. Julie, I'm gonna, yeah. Yes. Okay. You hear me? Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, Julie from one, two, three, North Hillside. Holly was saying, Julie, years ago, very poor. Yes. We can't hear you. Um, Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Okay. I just want to um, reiterate what Tolly was saying. I remember that process 10 years ago. Um, it was very clear we wanted to look at our buildings. Um, I agree with um, Lori in terms of her talking about the... Okay. Hello, is that better? Yeah. Nope. Do I need to repeat myself a third time? Okay. We're at home. Can you tell? Um, just want to say that I agree with Holly. I was going to bring that up. Julie, your Wi Fi is not working. <clears throat> I apologize, we can't hear you. Bernie, what would you like to do? Um, maybe she can come on back later. Or could she chat her comments? She can do the question to answer. Okay. We have one more question. Gina? Gina? There you are. Hello. Okay. I'm so sorry. I'm now outside. Oh, Julie, just hold on. We've asked Gina to talk. Just, okay. Just hold on one second. Gina, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll be really quick. Um, I uh, just wanted to let you know that um, I sent a letter on October 6th and I just want to quickly repeat the same questions that have been raised over and over again about the use of um, empty buildings in the area, which there are many. Um, so why not use an empty building and why not uh, build a retail store that meets the bylaws um, and right I don't see any benefit to granting the special permit um, certainly not to the residents that live 
there in the town of Deerfield, but also to the small businesses um, that are going to be hugely impacted by having this Colossus uh, sized uh, building next door. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm Gina Bordoni Cowley, 213 Greenfield Road. I own the little dinosaur shop. So I just, you know, I think that those questions just need to bear repeating and for everyone to just hear those again and, and consider that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can go back to Julie now. I think Julie's available. Yes. Can you hear me now? A little Hello. spotty. I'm outside, away from my Wi-Fi, using my whatever. If you can't hear me, it's because I live on 123 North Hillside Road, and I have 5 and 10 traffic, which is quite busy this time of day. I live near the Volvo place, which is wide open and ready for business. So I'd like to encourage movement to that area for a larger place if we need to go that route. I think the location has proven to be unsafe. The neighbors um, are unhappy with it. And the town itself at town meeting, once again, I want to re re reiterate, supported the woman, the neighbor to the town project that was being built. So I believe the town and majority is for this. The planning from 10 years ago was um, representational of that and um, I just think it's a horrible location and I've sent letters before I'm sure you've read it and I just want to thank you all so much for your work you've put into this um, I respect your work and I respect the planning work from 10 years ago and that's all I have to say thank you thank you, thank you. Jen anyone yes. else yeah We have Lily. Now, okay. Um, can you hear me? Because I can't hear yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Lily White. I live at 45 South. You need to speak up, please. We can't hear you. All right, okay. Um, my mic and my keyboard. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Lily Dwight. I live at 45 South Mill River Road. And one of the things that I have been wondering about, um, the applicant has been adamant that the building has cannot fit in what is allowed by our laws, that it has to be double that size. And that, so what are the benefits of having them double the size? Well, one of the benefits we were not privy to see the letter that was sent to your committee, apparently, about the benefits. But um, in the past, they've mentioned employment. And so what I am wondering is how many part-time, low-wage workers do they employ in a 9,000-square-foot building versus how many would be employed in a 4,000-square-foot building? And the odds are probably the same number or maybe only one different. So the benefit that I'm thinking that should be looked at is what is the difference between, what is the benefit that they bring that's the difference between what they are allowed by law to build versus what they're asking to do. And so employment wise, it is basically negligible because it's not even a guaranteed resident of the town of Deerfield who would get the benefit or the, the low wage job. Um, and then again, taxes wise, um, looking at the Bernardson store, um, they, if we look at what that is a comparable kind of thing, we would probably only earn about $5,000 a year more in taxes for a 9,000 square foot building than a 4,000 square foot building. And these types of stores, historically, it's been documented across the country it have a severe negative impact on local merchants. And in the time of the pandemic, I don't think $5,000 a year in taxes is worth losing, having our neighbors lose their livelihoods and the, all the consequences that roll out from that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Decker, you have a comment? Well, I just listening to what, what's being said. Uh, <clears throat> if that particular property, I could be corrected, but there are two lots there. Am I correct? There are two parcels of property there. So in theory, somebody could build a 4,000 square foot building on one and a 4,000 square foot on the other uh, together with the with the driveways and the accesses, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think it's much nicer to, to do the larger development than the smaller one, okay? Thank you, Mr. Decker. Uh, Jen? I have Amy. Amy, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you can see me? Okay. Um, Amy Gazen Schwartz, 3B Evans Lane. I'm an abutter to this property. I just want to say that Mr. Donnie, who has misstated the con some of the concerns about the abutters, and in particular, um, that letter that he read said that, um, well, he said we didn't want anything there, which is not true. It also says that uh, we should have known better that we were moving next to a commercial development. We fully were aware that that was zoned commercial. In fact, many of us participated in the town meeting where the zoning regulations were um, enacted that said that it was permitted by right to build a 4,000 square foot building. We understand that there can be commercial development there. But we also understand that it is not permitted by right to build a 9,300 square foot building. I sent you all a letter this afternoon with a picture of the view from the side of our property um, and ask you to imagine what it looks like. So um, please understand it's not that we don't want anything there. It's not that we want nothing in our backyard. It is not that we don't think it should be a commercial development. It's that we don't think a 9,300 square foot building that will serve as a convenience store with the associated parking and truck delivery, large truck delivery close to the edge of our property is appropriate for this location, especially when as others have said, there's other locations where it would be much more appropriate. So please understand that um, that was a misstatement on his part. Thank you. Thank you. Jen? Patricia? Patricia? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, good, good evening, everybody. Thank you for your time. I just want to say that... Um, uh, name and address, please. My name is Patricia Taylor. My address is 6 Evans Lane. I am a direct butter. I've sent many letters, and I've sent a picture from my backyard looking onto the lot. Can you still hear me? Yeah. I just want to say that if you, one thing that will make it easier to hear everybody is if everybody on the call mutes themselves when somebody is speaking. Otherwise, it's a lot, it's a lot harder to hear everybody. Um, I am a direct abutter. Um, this situation has affected the direct abutters. It's affected, it will and continue to affect our stress levels, our quality of life, our property values, and it's simply not meeting the criteria that has been set forth. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Judith. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to address the comments made by Mr. Decker about building two different, sorry, <laughs> two different buildings on those two lots. I think that's a presumption that we don't really know the answer to. The zoning code has dimensional requirements for, for uses on lots. And somebody would have to look carefully 
at what is planned on each lot for the size of the lot, for the setbacks, for the frontage, many, many things before you can just assume that somebody would be able to build two 4,000 square foot businesses on the lot. That's what I just want to be clear that what um, um, I think I don't know who, who said that, Mr. Decker, whoever was saying that, that's really speculation. We have no idea at this point. Thank you. Uh, you please remember, you must give us your name. Oh, sorry. We can't, we can't get this on the record unless we know who, who's made the comments, please. Uh, it's Judith Kundal, 22 Lee Road, South Deerfield. Thank you. Hey, Biggie Smalls. I was asking to start. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. So yes. I just wanted to also reply to uh, Mr. Decker's comment. Um, I believe that the town residents would much prefer to, assuming they would have the right to build 4,000 square foot facilities, the town residents would probably much prefer two 4,000 square foot facilities because they would require two driveways. They would be two buildings that would look relatively similar to the neighborhood, not a big single unit. So you're taking a lot, or he is taking a lot of, uh, of assumption, thinking that the town would be okay with a single just because they would have the right to build two. Name and address, uh, please, I'm uh, sorry. And, uh, Nicholas Orsini, uh, 34th Thayer Street. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. There's no, more, there's no more comments. Okay, no more comments. Um, at this time, I believe, Mr. Donahue, or, uh, would you like to make a uh, closing comment now? Unless there's any questions from the board members. Um, Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. John Sabrisky. Mr. Donahue, uh, I had asked, uh, and I think, uh, I, I thought this was going to happen, but maybe I wasn't clear uh, to have some other representations of the uh, scale of the building relative to the neighborhood. I know you brought brought a couple of thing, things in, but I, I I thought we had talked that there might be some additional presentations. Are there any, or is that, uh, or is what you've presented all you're going to present to us? Um, I, I think we've presented everything. I'll, I'll let Mr. Turner uh, interrupt me if not. Um, my recollection um, was that we did discuss uh, our request to do um, a, a model of sorts, um, but it appeared to be the, the will of the board that that was not required. Um, if there's some particular information that that you believe you asked for, sir, and we missed it. I apologize for that. But um, Austin, have we submitted everything we have? If I can yeah, pass. Yeah, uh, again, for the record, Austin Turner with Bowler. Um, Mark, that's correct. We had prepared a number of different visualizations that, uh, to give a depiction of scale in relation to other existing site features in the property itself. Um, I, I recall there being a discussion amongst the board that they thought that those those depictions were appropriate to satisfy that part of the discussion. That's not okay. my understanding of the sentiment of the board, but the, so be it, it's, uh, let's move on. I just wanted to make sure there were no other, no other depictions out there. Well, if, if, if the board feels it needs further information or further um, understanding um, uh, as to the, the visual impact or the appearance of the building, um, he might need a couple of moments to pull it um, onto his computer, Mr. Chairman, but I can certainly have Mr. Turner review with you 
this, by my memory, seven or eight different slides that we did present. And if at the end of that, the board feels it needs additional information, then we'll, if we can understand what that is, we'll be glad to try to provide it. Is, is, that, is that your will? Or? That is not my will. I, I, I had thought that um, at the last presentation, I was still not real happy in terms of the perspectives and how it was situated. And, I, and if I didn't make myself clear, I don't wanna rehash what we've already done before. Uh, I just didn't know whether anything else was brought. And if there wasn't, that, that we'll just go with what we have. That's fine. I mean, I'm not going to belabor it anymore. Uh, but I wanted to make sure you presented everything you wanted to present. Okay, I think, uh, Adam, you had your hand up. Do you have a comment? Well, Bernie, I just want to make sure we're on the same page because I know it's, it's a challenge with the Zoom. I heard you say what I thought was, okay, uh, so... We're done with public comment. Jen didn't have any other questions. And then you went to the board members. Should we make a motion to, or someone should make a motion that we're ending public comment, but continuing with the public hearing? Is, okay. that, what, is that what we're going to do? Mr. Yes, Chair? but I, Mr. Donahue asked for a closing statement. I don't know if he wants to make it now or do it later. I, I believe he requested it after the public comment. Am I correct? Well, I, I, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I'm, if if that's if if this evening session with the end of public comment takes care of that so that that's done what i want to make sure is that if there's any open questions or issues that the any board member feels that the applicant hasn't addressed completely we'd like to know what they are while we have an opportunity to respond or to get additional information if that's done then it would seem like it it's probably timely to, for the board to consider a close uh, a motion to close the public hearing. And I just asked before that happened that I have a chance to kind of be able to sum up um, the, you know, now 10 months of hearings that we've been through with the board, uh, just as an opportunity to close out the process. So I, I think if, if what um, Ms. Gannett has indicated is that there's no one else in the public who has a comment. It's your meeting, Mr. Chairman. I don't mean to usurp your authority. I just want to make sure there's no issues that are left hanging with any board member that the, the applicant can respond to. Okay, my understanding of what we were going to do was we were going to end public comment. But that doesn't mean we can't discuss with board members with you. Correct, Attorney Costa? Mr. Chairman, um, that's, this is Adam Costa, Town Council. So that's correct. There, there's a difference between ending public comment. In fact, it, it, at every session of the public hearing that's been conducted so far, there has come a point in time at session when public comment has ended and you have transitioned to a different stage in, in the meeting. Um, board questions or recap or further presentation by the applicant. So. Um, you've ended public comment for tonight's meeting, as I understood it. There were no further hands raised. Um, you now have the task of discussing amongst yourself as board members whether you think you have all the information you need. If, if my sense is correct and you're contemplating, and maybe other board members are contemplating a potential close of the public hearing, you need to discuss amongst yourselves whether you believe as a board collectively that you have all the information you need and you need nothing further from the applicant. Because once that public hearing is closed, although you can continue to, to, to deliberate, you have 90 days following the close of a public hearing to deliberate and issue a decision, you cannot ask for new information. You cannot receive new information even if you haven't asked for it. Um, I know some boards choose to keep the public hearing open even as they begin deliberations to assure themselves that uh, they, they can ask for additional information if they think they need it. They can ask for a question to be answered. I leave that to your discretion. Every board does it somewhat differently, um, but there, there is a difference between ending public comment and closing the hearing. Yeah, my recommendation, we close public hearing. Now, board members, we have to decide if we wanna leave this so we can ask questions if we have some that come up. So oh. let, let's, let's, go, let's go around and let's listen for some comments. Um, I think, John, you have the floor. You spoke first. Okay, so uh, Bernie, I, I would think we can end public comment, but we should keep the public hearing open 
because I think during our discussions and deliberations that there very well may be new information that comes up that we should take into consideration. Um, I, and, and I don't know whether it's appropriate now, uh, Mr. Chairman, but you know, I've done, I, I'm looking for some technical assistance that could help the board make its decision. And I do have a motion on it. Uh, um, and we wouldn't be able to take that information in if we closed our public hearing. Um, so maybe I'll, rather than keep everybody in suspense, uh, tell folks uh, what, I've, what I've been contemplating. Uh, some of you may know I'm a former county commissioner and uh, helped set up the FERCOG. And I, I know that they offer technical assistance to boards. And I went to them to see whether they could help the us, our board, in in uh, in delineating and, and looking, giving us technical assistance on the six criteria that we can look at. Uh, when I talked to the director of planning, she said they were maxed out. They can't do that these days, and she referred me to uh, the engineering firm of Time Bond, who they thought was somebody who practices in this area. When I reached out to them, I learned that they, in fact, gave the technical assistance to the planning board. And uh, so they have a good sense about this project. Um, <clears throat> I talked with a woman by the name of Tracy Adamski, who's the head planner. She's prepared a proposal uh, to provide the board technical assistance on the very things that we can uh, evaluate this proposal on. Uh, <clears throat> so, I, you know, I, I believe, and I'd like to get Attorney Costa's uh, opinion on this, that they have quoted a fee of just shy of $10,000 to do the work. Uh, there's also an outstanding bill that still is uh, of issue. Um, but uh, Attorney Costa, is this the kind of expense that uh, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals can ask the applicant to pay uh, pay for is is this one of the envisioned kind of kind of expenses? So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, to Mr. Stobierski's uh, question, um, Adam Costa Town Council. So um, the, the answer I think is yes. Um, you know wh whether that's the, the the will of the board. You mentioned the motion before, so that's obviously a board decision and you've got to make the request of the applicant for the funding. Applicants are never under any obligation to provide funding. There is a mechanism by which uh, boards, zoning boards, planning boards, conservation commissions, and others can collect fees, um, monies from applicants, can place those monies into uh, what's known as a, a 4453G. It's an escrow account that the municipality holds, uh, uses those monies to pay for consultants that would aid the board in its review if the board lacks the expertise that's necessary on a particular topic and then can refund any unused money to the applicant. And the applicant is familiar, this applicant is familiar with that process because they have provided such funding, for example, to the planning board previously when they were before the board for site plan review and for a stormwater permit. Um, these are monies that are often collected you know, very early on in the process to allow for the engagement of consultants that would complete reviews um, engineering reviews, uh, stormwater or drainage reviews, sometimes environmental reviews. Um, it, it really has to be an area that requires some expertise that the board lacks. Um, that is the standard for whether it's appropriate to engage a consultant. And again, you've got to ask the applicant. Applicants are under no obligation to do it. Um, but you know, in situations where the board truly needs the guidance, and an applicant refuses the monies, the courts don't look favorably upon that either. So um, there, there are certainly two sides to the, to the coin. Um, so uh, I wasn't sure how this, uh, whether uh, the applicant would pay for this or not, but I did, uh, I did let, uh, I got the proposal in yesterday afternoon and I, I gave it, I gave one copy to Bernie and I, and I uh, gave a copy to the select board and I know they have it and are considering it. And, and I don't know, I mean, you know, I don't know whether the town has offered to, uh, to fund it if the applicant has, and I haven't, haven't heard from them, but, uh, but I'm, maybe I'll make a motion and, 
and uh, perhaps we can uh, we can talk about it. Hey, uh, Jennifer, I know I forwarded the uh, the the, the um, proposal to uh, to sue this afternoon. Yes, I saw it. Okay, is it possible to share it with the members, or how does that work? Well, that would be up to the chair whether or not he would even want to entertain that at this time. Okay, so maybe what I, I would do is is move to uh, move that the zoning board of appeals retain time bond for uh, technical assistance with respect to our deliberations and that uh, the applicant uh, deposit the money that they have uh, asked for it's just shy of ten thousand uh, dollars in the appropriate accounts I, I think we have a little bit of a problem, John. I think you went ahead without clearing this through the chairman. My understanding well, Bernie, is- Bernie, I hate to interrupt you, but let's see if it gets seconded and then we can discuss the motion. Okay. Well, I think I have to, I have to entertain the motion. Am I correct, Adam? Um, it's your meeting, Mr. Chairman. You do have to- enter If I don't entertain it, then it's not gonna even be discussed. Uh, I suppose that would be true, yes. Oh, okay. But if it has not been seconded, if it hasn't uh, been uh, hold seconded. It, hold it, Mr. Potter, no comments, please. Okay. No comments. Um, we got a situation here where this really should be going through the, I don't have a problem if we had uh, voted on it, but we had a member take an action, I believe, without a vote. I don't, did we take, a, I don't think we took a vote on uh, going out. I mean, there was, there was talk about it, but I never thought we took a vote on it. No, so no. I'm, a, I'm a little I'm a little concerned it happened without the board having a chance to discuss it. Now that doesn't mean we we can't entertain it, but I'm a little upset that we we have to be careful that board members don't go out on their own because we represent the board. Even myself, I don't represent everybody. I represent what I feel. So um, it's it's a little bit of a sticky situation here with with moving out. Um, but I think we I will entertain it. But then that means we have to we'll have we'd have to have a vote on it. If if we want to just have a general discussion on it now, if uh, uh, yeah, I thought it would be the appropriate time to do it since we were going to raise okay. questions at this time, and this was going to be one of my questions: is do we need technical assistance? So rather than delay a meeting, I do, you know, and Bernie, I know I talked to you about it. I thought the county would be help, helpful and, and you actually told me, yeah, go talk to the county. So I did and they said, we don't do it and told me to go elsewhere. So I just kind of followed that path to bring it to the board so we could discuss it and see if it's something we wanted to do. Um, so, I mean, I, I can withdraw my motion and make it later, but it's but I didn't want to kind of be talking about things hypothetically and not letting people know, you know, you know what I've been what I've been thinking about. But I do believe I think it's in the best interests of the town to have objective evidence and technical assistance that would enable us to weigh uh the decision that we have to make on this and the best way to do that is to have you know i mean I, an engineer and a, and a firm that's experienced in this stuff advise us okay uh i'll entertain the motion and we'll uh, uh members want to speak to this uh and then we'll see what happens from that point on mr chair mr decker, mr. decker comment mr chairman you need a second before you can proceed to comment Oh, do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, Adam seconds it. Mr. A Alex seconded. Okay, uh, Adam. Adam, uh, well, we have technical assistance that we've been paying for for every meeting. He's sitting here with us right now, Mr. Costa, and he's been advising us along the legal pathways, so I can't see spending another $10,000 uh, on on having people answer the same questions. I mean, um, we, we, the town and the applicant, and there's been peer reviews, and 
my binder on this topic from the applicant's perspective and from the wonderful members of our community. I mean, I spent, uh, you know, over an hour and a half just reading emails from, from people that are concerned in the community. Um, and, and there's also multiple studies and peer reviews and, and everything else. So I, I can't see us gaining anything from another tie and bond uh, interpretation. I think the technical assistance from Mr. Costa would be adequate enough for me uh, on how to uh, how we apply the law. Um, and I think that that's our biggest uh, challenge because there's differing of opinion um, on how we should apply the law and um, in our stake in applying the law. So I'm not in favor of, of retaining high time bond either out of the town's dime or the applicant's dime. Uh, that, that's where I stand on it. Uh, Mr. Zalowski, may I, may I respond? Yes. So with respect to the criteria that we will be evaluating this proposal on, uh, they are outside the expertise of Attorney Costa. Obviously, he's going to guide us on the law and he's, he does a very good job at it. But we're supposed to look at like the, I mean, I'm going through the criteria again, like the, the social and community needs, traffic flow and safety, neighborhood character and social structures. Uh, those are the kinds of uh, criteria that we're going to try to decide whether the detriments are worth the benefits. <laughs> and, um, and, and I know people say this, the, the, the intersection is, uh, is, uh, meets the uh, standards for the state, but that's not really our, uh, what we're evaluating. We're evaluating whether the safety uh, problems are worth the detriments or the safety benefits are worth the detriments of, of the increased activity in that area. So we're on kind of a, even though we've had a traffic study, that is not, that was not how we evaluate what, uh, what our role is. So I think we really need assistance in order to put together a good decision. I'm gonna be frank with what my feelings are about what's happening is that there's gonna be one side that's going to be disappointed with whichever way we make a decision. And the best way for us to make the right decision is to have it defensible with objective evidence. And, and we, none of us can give a, a objective evidence but uh, someone who gives us technical assistance can, and that's where that's gonna be of assistance to us. Uh, so um, I'm looking to help keep us out of trouble, to advise us and to have us make us the, make the right decision. Chair? Uh, any other comments? Mr. Potter has a comment. Mr. Chairman. Excuse uh, me, uh, Mr. Potter has a comment. I was recognized or I will be recognized. Yes. My hand has been up. Thank you very much. Um, to Mr. Staberski's points, I, um, and, and also Mr. Sokolowski's comments, um, I tend to agree more with Mr. Sokolowski that um, the criteria, while specific, are not, there's, there's no metrics or parameters provided that, that, that demand us to, um, uh, either uh, to take or to agree with um, any particular uh, authorities. Uh, what you might say is objective uh, assessments, but but I don't I don't think that that um, uh, comes into play here. If you read the criteria, it's up to us to out to 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 determine um, whether the proposed benefits outweigh the detriments in view of all these particular characteristics um, and, in, and the de determinations shall include consideration of each of the following. Um, how do we measure social, economic, or community needs? There's, there's, I don't think Ty and Bond are gonna help us with that. We've got all the information we could possibly um, require for us as a board to consider the traffic flow and safety issues, including parking and loading, um, neighborhood character and social structures, you know, impacts in the natural environment that's that's information that's already been brought to our attention um, they've been to concom they've been to the planning board um, potential fiscal impact 
you know, I, 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 I don't think that we're going to uh, benefit or convince any uh, uh, court in the future that uh, if we take somebody's uh, report on potential fiscal impact and base our decision on it, then that, that, that makes us right. I think that we have to come to our decision based upon the evidence at hand. Um, and um, there's many subjective characteristics of the um, criteria that is not going to be, um, I don't think it's possible to have a, an official or a professional expert opinion on the neighborhood character and social structures or the social, economic or community needs. Um, so I, I, I disagree that we need to extend this and get anybody to consult further with us. Okay, thank you, Mr. Potter. We had uh, Mr. Decker, did you have a comment? Yes, I tend to agree with Mr. Sokolowski and Mr. Potter. Um, I'm a little bit upset the fact that somebody went ahead and went outside the parameters and, and solicited a, a quote on something without bringing it to the attention of all the board members at the time. And I just, it's, it's late in the ball game and all of a sudden we've got somebody out there shopping for an opinion that he's gonna want. And I don't necessarily agree. So I'd like to move, we call a question as to whether or not uh, we go to an outside consultant. Uh, Alex, comment? Alex, comment? Yep. Um, hmm. Sounds like, um, I, I think I know where everybody stands. Um, for me, um, I guess I'm 50-50. Um, I do think that we could benefit from um, another perspective, but um, again, at, at the same time, we all live here and we all understand the neighborhood fairly well. And um, I, I think uh, uh, we can stand on our own two feet and make that decision. And um, that I believe can stand up to court um, if it so goes that way. Um, uh, maybe if this was, three or four months ago, maybe if we had considered bringing them on um, as consultants, uh, that may have been better. Um, but uh, I think we can, I think we can make a, a decision. And um, I believe that, uh, uh, again, we can, it can stand up um, just in our own language. So. Okay, do I have any motions? I did, I called a question on the motion. Okay. Do well, I have a second? Alex made the made the Mr. original. Chairman. Oh, you want on the call question? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. There, there's it, it, unless you decide you wish to entertain the the motion to call the question. You, you've already solicited feedback from all the members of the board, and there's a motion on the floor. So you can simply you could simply uh, call a vote on the motion. I, I would recommend you know you've got what, six members in attendance tonight? Right. Um, and so, as you know, um, uh, and I, I say this to avoid a, a potential tie vote, I don't, I don't know that that's where it's gonna go or not, but you've got a five member board. Um, in fact, you've got, a, you've got seven members total, two alternates. Um, in this case, you've got four regular members who are, who are presiding on this case. Um, I think that if you're gonna begin to take votes on matters of substance, you ought to uh, reiterate who it is that is voting on this matter. So obviously the four regular members are voting. You've got two alternates. You need to identify which of the alternates is going to be sitting as a voting member, at least if this matter were to proceed to a final vote tonight, uh, minimally for the purpose of the vote on the question, the, the motion that's on the floor. Okay, because I was not gonna do that unless I had a second. Do we have a second? You had a second. You had a second that allowed us to deliberate. Okay, all right. So. Um, I'm going to accept it and we're going to take a vote and I'm going to uh, uh, identify the voting members at this time. Um, get my glasses. Adam Sokolowski, voting member. Robert Decker, voting member. John Staberski, voting member. And Alex, voting member. Those will be our five, five members. Don't forget yourself. Oh, do I need to put myself down? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And the chair, myself. 
Strasky. Okay. <coughs> We're voting on the motion. And now I forgot what the motion was. The motion was to um, close. No, the motion was to hire an outside consultant. I'm sorry, hire the outside consultant. For the tone of $10,000. Okay, so we're going to vote on Please voting for an outside consultant. Mr. Decker. Against. Hold on, let me get this so I can record this, please. Uh, Mr. Decker was a no vote, a nay vote. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Stamerski. Yes. Votes yes. Uh, Alex. Uh, no. Uh, Mr. Adam. I'm the only one left. I, I know, but you didn't put it on my sheet. I'm recording all this down. That's why I'm taking some time. No, I'm against uh, hiring Ty and Mon. Okay, against, and I'm also against it. So it does not pass uh, with a four to one. Three to one. Right, denied with four nays and one yes. So the motion is denied. Now, I have a question. I, I can't see on my screen tonight where to raise my hand. I'm sorry, so I'm kind of just raising it like this. Yep. Um, I understand why Mr. Stavarski brought this up at the time because we're talking about whether or not we were going to close the public hearing or, and he obviously wanted to get this out before we decided that. So I did hear you say we were done with public comment for tonight, Mr. Chair. So would it make sense to do a vote that we're done with public comment and that we're going to continue the public hearing? Or would you like a motion for that? I think that would be a good idea. Okay. I'll make the motion that we are going to close comment from the public and we're going to continue the public hearing. Okay. Do I have a second? So moved. So moved. Okay. So this is to close public comment. And I think we have to do it separately, right, Adam? To keep them uh, keep it open, I don't think we can do it as a a writer. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I certainly defer to your discretion as to you know the sorts of motions that are made, seconded, and voted upon. Different again, different boards do it different ways. There's, there's no necessity of a motion when the chair declares that you're moving to a different session section of the meeting. There's there's no need to close the public comment session. If the hearing is open. The hearing is open. You can accept new information, you can accept public comment at your discretion, or you can refuse it at your discretion. But if there's a desire to make it very clear for the public that there is going to be no more public comment, even though the hearing will still be open, I suppose that motion can be made, and that would be a single motion made, seconded, and voted upon. Okay. So we had a second for that. I, I, I think we should go to and, and declare if we're going to close it to public comment. End public comment. Right. And I'm sorry. And, uh, and no, public comment. No, right. Nothing is being closed. Nothing is being closed. We're leaving the meeting open, but we're closing. No, we're ending public comment. I got this in my notes, and I'm got 50 things I'm trying to do here. Okay, let's take a vote on that, please. Mr. Decker. Yes. Adam. Yes. Myself. Yes. Mr. Stavarsky. Yes. Yes. And Alex. Yes. Okay. So the motion is carried. Mr. Chair. Okay. So it's carried to close to end public comments, and we're going to keep the meeting open. Does that sound correct? It does. It does. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I have a point of order, though? Yes. Um, when you're recording votes, and you did this on the last vote, you recorded Mr. Hershenreiter's vote both ways. And I thought both Mr. Potter and Mr. Hershenreiter were, were alternates, and one of them was going to be selected. So for these votes, 
um, and maybe Mr. Costa can uh, can help us. Uh, if Mr. Gershenreiter is going to vote, Mr. Potter should also vote, or neither of them should vote. They're both alternates. Um, so through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so yeah. you, your board, the Zoning Board of Appeal, Appeals in, in Deerfield, is a five member board. Right. Um, you have five regular members. You also have authority by statute to uh, uh, have appointed two alternates, which you, you have. So you have seven total members, five regular members and, and two alternates. Um, in the usual course, the regular members would be the only voting members, the alternates. Um, and it, from my perspective, and I know I've advised you of this, Mr. Chairman, the alternates can certainly participate in the discussion meeting to meeting, but ultimately they wouldn't. Um, the alternates do step in to vote, one or both of them, in instances where the five regular members, one or two of them, uh, or, or more can't be present. And that's because of sometimes conflict of interest and recusal. Sometimes it's due to illness or unavailability. Uh, it's because they've missed more than one meeting and a multi-session public hearing. In those instances, those members essentially become regular members for the purposes of that particular matter that's before the board. And so that's why going back about 10 or 15 minutes ago, I suggested to you, Mr. Chairman, that you identify which of the two alternates was going to be filling the fifth seat on the board for purposes of votes. I still believe that both, both Alex and David can participate in the discussion as it moves forward and indeed in the deliberations as well, but only one of them will be voting on motions that are made. And I believe Mr. Chairman, you indicated that that would be Alex. Um, so the, the five members are the four regular members and filling the fifth regular member seat is Alex. Okay. I'm, I Thank you for clarifying the point of order. Okay, um, I think we should take a bathroom, 10 minute bathroom break would be nice. Um, when we come back, I think we're gonna go into some discussion. Does that sound favorable to everybody? Yes. I think we need to go in a little discussion. Mr. Donahue, you all set? He doesn't need a bathroom break. You're a young man. No, no, that's that, that's far from true. Thank you for the break, and that's okay. fine. Well, you All right. So um, it's seven twenty. We'll start at seven twenty. All right, for everybody. All right. Thank you.
Seven twenty, Bernie. I see Mr. Decker's here. Um, Alex is here. Mr. Tabersky, Mr. Sokolowski. Mr. Potter, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we're going to move into the um, this discussion phase. Is that correct, Mr. Casa? Yes, deliberations. Okay, we're going to go into deliberation of um, the information that we've been presented with and see what we can come up with. Now, um, I had an idea of how we could approach this, but board, pre please uh, feel free to comment. I thought we'd go through each one of the, uh, the areas 5321, 5322, 5323, 24, 25, and 26, and then we could address each of these uh, areas. Or we could have Mr. Donahue address each of the areas, whichever way we wanted to do it. But I think we need to address those. If we had comments or questions or no comments or questions on each one of these. So we cover all these six areas that we need to cover. Comments by the board. Uh, uh, Mr. Yes, Chair? John. There is... Um... And, and I just want to uh, keep in mind that when that, although we have those six areas, if you look at the preamble to how we're supposed to evaluate those uh, three, those six areas, it's whether the proposed use, the benefits outweigh the detriments on the town and then it's and the neighborhood. So I think when we're looking at each one of those six um six areas we need to one look at how it affects the global town and, and then two how it affects the neighborhood uh, in terms of going through the evaluation okay uh, duly noted so members please keep that in, um, in your questioning when we go through this uh, mr donahue would you like to address each one specifically uh, board members would you like to um, Ask questions, or we're going to just go as a topic uh, 5321. I'd like to go eat, uh, each one, each area. That are we in agreement on that? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone disagree, so let's go. Uh, 5321, social uh, or economic community needs. Comments or questions? Yes, John. Well, I mean, I think what we have, what we should do is look at and think, to, we should, and I think we should have a kind of a robust discussion on this in looking at what are the benefits as opposed to the detriments of the proposal. Then let's take social, the first one, and then look at the town and the neighborhood. So if I were to look at the social benefits for the town, I don't see it have much of an effect either way on the town in general uh in terms of a social benefit or detriment i think it's kind of a neutral um but in terms of the neighborhood i think it's probably there is a there is a significant or a substantial or at least a detriment to the neighborhood uh as have been kind of discussed by the neighbors um from a social standpoint um Economic, you know, if, if it's about $5,000 in taxes, I don't think that's going to make a big difference one way or another. I don't think there's a big economic uh, 
benefit or detriment. Uh, community, I don't know if I look at the, if I look at community on the town, um, I thought that from our planning from 10 years ago that we were trying to focus our commercial activity in the center of South Deerfield. Um, we're trying to make our center of South Deerfield more of a commercial hub. Um, and if I recall, and it was 10 years ago, and I was part of a lot of those discussions, is one of the things that I think a lot of people commented on is that they didn't want to see Route 5 and 10 become another Route 9 in Hadley uh, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of commercial, a big commercial strip. And I think that was kind of the basis of why or one of the reasons I should say why we, why the town put a limit of 4,000 square feet on commercial establishments. So <clears throat> when I look at the third part of that first criteria community, I think, and I, and I know this has been talked about by some members of the public, but I think that's fairly substantial for the town uh, with respect to what our planning had been and our and our and how this was voted on and I think it's probably even with respect to the neighborhood in the community I think it's even a, a, a probably a bigger detriment for the community for the neighborhood so that's my take on those and what what I was thinking and how I'm going to vote in my mind is kind of line up what are the detriments and what are the benefits for each a little subcategory and hopefully come out weighing those and, and coming out with a decision. But that's how I, that's how I look at the first criteria. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, Alex? Um, I, I, don't, I won't, <clears throat> I, I don't think I'm ready to give my entire spiel on the first um, section yet, but uh, John, do you think um, just as um, just for fun, uh, do you think if the development goes in, do you think, um, again, I'm, I really don't want uh, Route 5 and 10 to turn into Route 9 either. I, I definitely don't want to do that. Um, but do you think that um, if uh, the development goes in, do you think that may um, allow for some linkages, um, maybe sort of a stretch of the um, center? district, if you will. Um, I know it's, um, how, how do I want to put this? Maybe if, if we allow the development to go through, um, or if we choose to do that, um, do you think that might be a starting point for new businesses um, to come in? Um, I guess this can be for everybody as well, but just curious. Well, my one of my thoughts on this is, is the precedential value or precedent that we'd be establishing. Uh, our board has, uh, or the, the ZBA, ha we have not, except for Yankee Candle, have not granted a, uh, a special permit for any commercial establishment above 4,000 square feet. I believe this would be the first one. So once you do it once, it it's, it's makes it much harder to say no to the next uh, greater than 4,000 foot, I shouldn't say commercial, I mean retail establishment. Um, I mean, it, it, commercial we have, I think I think the board voted on uh, on the, the storage facility and that is over uh, 4,000 square feet, but it's not a retail establishment. So it's whether we're gonna have, you know, a, a, a bunch of retail establishments up and down five and 10 that, you know, uh, and, uh, my recollection of some of the discussions is that for a lot of the big retail establishments, it's, it's, it's harder to have a smaller store. So rather than having individually owned kind of mom and pop stores, like we have for the vast majority on five and 10, we'd have more chains uh, because they, they tend to want larger facilities. Um, and that was kind of the discussions that centered around this 4,000 foot, 4,000 square foot uh, number. 
um, back four year, ten years ago or so. So that's my thinking. But. Mr. Chair, David Potter has his hand raised. Um, yes. Remember, Dave, you're not voting, but we're going to listen to comments. Go ahead, David. Are, are you just going to go around or? Yes, yes, yes. Great. If it's if, if uh, yeah, if I may or if you were going to call on somebody else, I don't mean to take any. No, go ahead. Go ahead. We want to hear what you have to say. Um, my feeling is that um, in terms of the town benefit, if we're looking at the social, economic, or community needs served by the proposal, um, you know, I look at the I look at the uh, letter. Excuse me. Sorry. Can you still see me? Yes. Okay. All right. I look at the letter from Mr. Donahue, um, and I'm I, I I look to that as the articulation of the proposed benefits. Um, that that really was. Um, what I had asked for particularly last time and 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 uh, you know they brought it forward um, and I want to go through their proposed benefits and, and consider if there's any um, social economic benefits that they're proposing so that we can discuss it relative to the uh, 5321 the social, economic, and community needs. And um, I see the traffic as a potential community benefit that they speak to here and the improvements to five and 10 that would come with it. Um, that could be seen as a social economic uh, improvement for the town, uh, for the neighborhood. Um, I'm looking at their other comments and it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to distill where they feel that there is actual benefit to us and where they feel that the concerns voiced by the community are um, irrelevant or um, refutable. Um, you know, so they speak to the possibility of leaving the land empty and uh, they argue that they have a right to build. I don't think that's at issue. And that doesn't describe a benefit. Um, they also discuss the commercial building in proximity to residential homes. And uh, they discuss how it is a commercial zone, um, which is really not at issue either. It, it, it doesn't describe for me a benefit when they say that they, um, uh, you know, have a commercial zone, they're proposing a commercial property that they have buffers on. Uh, they, they, they comment on the, the perceived drawback that, that Dollar General is a bad business and they um, indicate and comment that um, the um, identity of the applicant is irrelevant. Well, we as a board know that. We've heard a lot of comments from the public that uh, pertain to the character of the business. Um, we've discussed it, but we all have been advised and we know that it's not a point on which we can consider uh, whether they're deserving or not of the special permit. So again, this doesn't tell me from their point of view what any benefit is with regard to that issue. Um, they discuss its competition for local businesses. And they discuss how that's the American way, right? They say that specifically. Nobody's arguing that. I don't think that we as a board are denying or considering denying or approving anybody based on it being a retail, based on it being competition. Um, there is discussion of that in the community comments for sure. Um, and there is uh, certainly um, 
uh, you know, a, a history and a, and a, and a known, uh, uh, you know, outcome that people can get out competed, that, that big guy squashed the little guy. Um, they saying they have the right to do it. That doesn't tell me a benefit from their point of view on our social economic. That in fact sounds a little bit like a negative. While I don't, I know they have the right, um, I, I don't feel like it's in the best interest of the town to bring in uh, something that is likely to and has in the past um, in other settings, uh, you know, had negative economic impact in the town. And that happens with lots of bigger stores and we see that. And, you know, so we're looking at whether this is a benefit for the town or not. To me, that possibility, that, that great potential um, doesn't strike me as any benefit, um, you know, even, yeah, I guess I would have to say that. Um, they, 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 they speak to the issue of whether Deerfield needs it and, and the, the community saying they don't need it. Um, and um, here they try to describe additional employment opportunities and convenient location, more competitive price for senior citizens. I do think that has to be taken into consideration. Um, uh, to me, it's hard to see it as a big enough benefit to merit this kind of special permit. And for me, a lot of it comes back to that. What real benefit above being, um, you know, um, uh, a, a reasonable business that will employ people and, you know, um, isn't negative to the town. Certainly, I, I, I can agree that senior citizens uh, and others would value uh, more competitive prices. And I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, it, so I'm not going to quibble with that. To me, it's almost a draw in that category, whether they present me with a good enough benefit to consider granting this special permit. Um, they, 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 they uh, articulate an issue from the community that, that I want something else, that the people just want a different use. Um, and we know that we're not, you know, um, necessarily, um, well, here, what they say is that zoning law is not determined as part of some grandiose master plan. Rather, a town establishes the rules through zoning and an applicant proceeds to utilize a piece of land for its own benefit, which is an interesting turn of phrase, and has the burden of demonstrating that such a use will not have an adverse impact upon the surrounding area. Um, I, 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 don't, I think they have it a little bit backwards. They have to propose that it has a benefit, not to, to refute the fact that there's adverse appeal or adverse impact. Um, and so I think that um, they are in fact kind of tipping their hand and saying it right out there. They're gonna utilize a piece of land for their own benefit. Uh, so to me, it doesn't sound like a benefit for the community. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see how it is. And I think that there is a part of zoning which has a, maybe not a grandiose master plan, but a, a certain vision, a certain uh, idea of what is, uh, you know, going to be in our home. And uh, that speaks to the reason why the special permit was put into place. So I don't see that as a benefit. And they discussed the development will destroy the environment. So they, 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 they try to, um, uh, you know, respond to that. Um, I, I don't really think that is exactly what people have been saying. I think there's great impact. Uh, I think that the, the direct abutter, the, the rock and dinosaur shop has a lot to be concerned about um, with, with the development there. But, um, uh, you know, I think that that's not really our purview. The, the planning board, the Conser conservation committee um, are more equipped to comment on those. And um, uh, my, my feeling is that uh, I never thought they were going to destroy the environment. I'm sure they're willing to do whatever it takes to stabilize the environment. I don't, I don't think that um, not destroying the environment is necessarily a benefit that merits getting this special permit. Uh, they finally, their last response is to the issue of the building is too big. And they say that um, uh, by special permit, it could be up to 60,000 square feet in size. It is far less than the maximum density pursuant to the zoning bylaw. I'm not quite sure what that means, and I'm, I'm open to hearing what, about that more. It is far less than both the maximum density 
pursuant to the zoning bylaw and far less in size, height, and magnitude than other buildings in the general commercial vicinity, including those recently permitted by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, well, I would want to know more information, just a little bit about that. But, um, you know, um, to me, when I as a resident view that area, I am not seeing and feeling way down where a number of commercial buildings have been. And I, I think they may be referring to the um, moving and storage facility, uh, which um, um, was put in and I believe permitted uh, by this board in the past. Um, and so which I feel personally and what I've heard from others in the community is um, that that um, that that does fit in a bit more with the general stretch of five and 10 there. It is not physically, uh, culturally, visually part of the community and the neighborhood at that five and 10 intersection. So they're taking a lot of liberty with, I think, defining um, well, no, I, I take that back because uh, they're probably referring to the, the specific zoning called general commercial uh, vicinity. Um, but in any case, um, I don't feel that they have proposed a benefit um, by saying that it could be up to this size. I, I don't really understand the maximum density comment. Um, and uh, I, I don't really believe their language that it is far less in size, height, and magnitude than other buildings. I, I, I take issue with that. And um, I think in my estimation, as I say, when I look at that neighborhood and we are charged with considering the neighborhood as much as the town, I don't see that there. And it would dwarf the community. Um, and and uh, I think uh, overall the uh, the, the, the first issue there of 5321, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not convinced that they're proposing enough benefit at, at all. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Donahue, question or response? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue, uh, and thank you to Mr. Potter for his comments. I appreciate them. Let me try to clarify what we are trying to say uh, with regard thank to the size, of, the size of the building. Um, but what we were referring to specifically uh, is the design of the property in comparison to the dimensional uh, authorizations of your zoning bylaw. Your zoning bylaw allows in a commercial district impervious cover, which is building, parking areas, and drives to be up to 60% of a lot area. The, the, the development before you is 36% of the lot area. And therefore it is less dense as far as impervious cover is concerned uh, in that fashion. Zoning bylaw further allows buildings in the commercial zone to be taller than this building is. It also allows buildings or parking to be closer to abutting properties. And that's important in thinking of the massing and the like, particularly when one looks at the plan and notices that there's not one but two visual screens that have been created next to the residential properties uh, who decided to locate next to the commercial property. The, the, the nuance that I was putting in the letter that, um, that you missed, and I can understand how that would happen, so let me try to explain it about the benefit of allowing this site to be used for this proposed use, by definition means it won't be used for another commercial use. One needs to accept, I think, the premise that the land is going to be put to some use that's permitted under zoning. And our, our thought and our position is that this type of commercial use is a low impact type of commercial use. It is for the dimensional reasons I just talked about. It is a low traffic generator. Uh, it increases traffic to the road of approximately 2% compared to other types of uses. It doesn't emit any noise essentially except for vehicles coming and going. It doesn't emit any odors. It doesn't emit any particulate or any of that type of use. One might say, well, that doesn't matter because it couldn't happen, but that ignores the fact of a couple of important things under your zoning bylaw. In this commercial district, for example, this site could be used once again, obviously, with a special permit from your board for a contractor's yard. 
which would have much more outdoor uh, uh, material, much more noise, much more dust and those type of things. It could be used for a truck, a bus or freight terminal. Uh, certainly much more intrusive to the abutting residential neighborhood. It could be used, and I think this is particularly important to note, it could be used by special permit for a manufacturing, processing, or fabrication facility that cannot meet the performance standards of Section 4900 of the bylaw. And the reason that's important is Section 4900 sets, sets forth certain parameters that if you're manufacturing a fabrication building can meet, such as sound levels at property, hours of operation, any other things that I won't belabor because it's not really material here, then those uses are permitted as of right. If you can't meet those, for example, if you want to operate before 6 a.m. or after 9 p.m., if you are going to produce more than 65 decibels of noise at the property line, you need a special permit. All of those uses, I think we can all recognize, would be more intrusive upon the neighborhood than the use here. And so what we see as a benefit is commercial land that abuts a residential zoning district is being used in a fashion that will have as little impact as possible. I'm not suggesting it doesn't have any drawback. This is a weighing process and it's not up to the applicant to demonstrate that there's no drawback from using a very pretty open field for commercial use. But in weighing it and looking what else could happen, and that was the point that I was making specifically, you were referring to Mr. Potter. We see the benefit of this type of use far over any of the other types of uses that could happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, other members' comments? Adam, are you there? Adam Sokolowski, are you there? Yeah, I've been here. I'm just, oh. I've just hold my, I've had a long day uh, and night, so I'm just holding my face up and chewing on some Reese's and drinking water. So I didn't want to put everybody through that misery of watching me hold my head up here um, on the whole time. But uh, I've heard uh, the extensive comments by uh, Mr. Stabersky and Mr. Potter and the response from the applicant. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, 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 Attorney Costa, what's happened is we had a power outage in town and some of us have been uh, kind of in a not a good situation, not much sleep, running generators. So you have to bear with us and board members and, and Mark also. The John's been another one. We've been we've been without power, so we're not in the best of shape. Uh, it's been some long nights. Hopefully let it be straightened out. Okay, 5322. Comments, which is uh, traffic flow and safety, including parking and loading. Comments. I'm happy to comment if no one else is. I don't want to yep. be always. Go ahead, John. That's all right. Um, so with respect to this, you know, I recognize that the intersection uh, will be improved if um, – if this project is is approved and, and that is appreciated. The question is, is it is it improved enough um, and whether what it's going to bring, and I know uh, Mr. D Attorney Donahue says that it's not a lot of use, uh, but I, it's my opinion that the traffic flow and safety is, is a detriment tempered by the improvements to the intersection. Um, living here a good chunk of my life and going through that intersection multiple, multiple times, maybe over a th maybe over 5,000 times over my life, um, you know how fast cars are on that stretch of, of road. And I mean, it's, it's, it was probably one of the reasons for the accident that occurred, um, you know, the, this, this past weekend, that any additional activity there is going to cause a safety issue. You know, is it in compliance with state standards? Absolutely. But that's not how we look at it. We look at whether the benefits are worth the detriments. And, um, and you know, I've, I've talked about pedestrians. I've talked about uh, bicyclists. I think it's, it's yeah, I cross on my bike at every crossing of five and 10 in this town. And that is probably the hardest crossing and the most dangerous. Um, 
Bernie, when we both were young, there used to be a yellow flashing light going uh, north and south on five and 10 and a red flashing light uh, at North Main Street and Mill Village. And, and that's not there. Even an improvement like that would bring attention that that's a, you know, a dangerous intersection. So I think any, any activity, any commercial activity on that corner, it doesn't matter whether it's Dollar General or Exxon is going to be a detriment. That, that's a, that's a, a, dangerous inter, a dangerous intersection that is gonna become more dangerous, maybe a little tempered by the improvements, but it's still gonna be dangerous. So um, I would put that traffic flow and safety in the detriment uh, column, both for the town and probably even more so for the neighborhood. Okay, thank you, John. Anyone else? No other company. Alex? Yep. Um, I, I agree with John. I, I think um, I think regardless, even if there's no development there, I think um, it would be nice to see something at that intersection done to make it a little bit safer to um, drive, walk, bike, whatever uh, your mode of transport is. Um, I don't, I think what the applicant has shown, um, is great. I think that's an awesome start. I don't, is there any way that, uh, the town or even the board, can we push the state at all, um, to say, look, you know, can, can we do something more here? Um, or are we sort of stuck saying, well, the state has, you know, the state owns the road and that's just the way it goes. Um, I, I mean, do we have any, I guess we could write a letter, but I don't know how much that's going to do. Um, I just, I would feel a lot better if, um, ideally there would be a light there, but um, I, I don't know if other people would be, would, would agree with that, but I think that would make me sleep a little bit better knowing that. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's something, if we could bring somebody from district two down and say, hey, you know, this is how we feel. And uh, we've been living here for a long time and uh, we know the situation here pretty well. Um, can we do something else? Um, I don't know if that's possible, but um, yeah. Any other comments? Uh, Mr. Donahue, comment or not? Yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mark Donahue. Um, I, I, I think maybe the, the two comments from the members hits to the point, which, you know, it, as I understand them, and I don't, I don't mean to paraphrase, but um, that essentially any use of this lot is going to add to a bad situation. Um, that, that's really not an acceptable basis for denying this or any other application. What it, I think you have to look at, once again, is the way, is that if you have what you perceive to be an unsafe situation and the applicant has brought to you specific concrete ways to improve that based upon comments received in the planning board process and comments received here. And I refer, refer specifically to comments heard from board members and from the public during the ZBA about the desire to improve bicycle uh, access or utilization in that area. And you have those things and you have warnings being put in. Uh, one can only conclude that those improvements have the effect of rendering it safer. It may not be as safe as possible, but it is a state controlled road um, that meet, ha it has to meet certain warrants for lights and those type of things. And those simply don't exist. And we can't, we, we don't get anywhere by arguing that it's simply a fact. Um, and with, you know, if, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, because this has gone back and forth, it, it might be worth, if you're willing to have Mr. Kelly just tick through, um, you know, briefly all, all the all the improvements that are being suggested to the intersection to try to address the safety issue, and also address the fact of the sight distance and everything else from the driveway. So, if, if you would indulge, I'd, I'd ask Mr. Kelly to do that. Yes, Mr. Kelly, please address that thank issue. You. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, Sean Kelly with Vanass Associates. So, just to, to walk through the improvements again and and these didn't come out of a vacuum. These were improvements that were outlined as part of a road safety audit that was done by MassDOT for this location a number of years back. Um, it's listed input from the state, 
from town agencies, you know, DPW, police, fire, everyone weighed in and came up with a list of, of things that they felt would improve safety out here. Um, some, of the, some of the highlights are, you know, it's a very dark intersection at night. Um, if you go through here at night, it's pitch black, there's no lighting. We're putting in overhead street lights to illuminate the location. That in and of itself will make this a much safer location for nighttime traffic. Um, today, there are no turning lanes on the corridor. So when you're making a left-hand turn, you know, it, it's not a designated turn bay. Traffic behind you or approaching you doesn't know if you're making a left or if you're going through. We propose to put left turn lanes both northbound and southbound on 5 and 10, onto Mill Village, onto North Main Street, and then also, you know, into the project site. Um, the, the signage out there doesn't necessarily uh, conform with current MUTCD guidelines. We're adding a number of new signs along the corridor as well as on the side streets, um, North Main and Mill Village. Um, the pavement markings out there are, are lacking. Again, I, I pointed out tonight, you know, one of the things that's missing on those side streets is a, is a good reflective stop bar that tells people this is where you stop when you get to the intersection. And, and I'm not saying that necessarily was the contributing factor to the recent crash, but when you're coming down these side streets and it's just a, a sea of pavement with no markings, it's difficult to know where you have to stop. We would remedy that by putting that in there. Um, and then I think maybe the biggest one, and it's come up a couple of times, is bicycle accommodations. Along our frontage today, there, there is not, and I want to reiterate this, there is not sufficient shoulder today to accommodate bike traffic. So when you are traveling by our site, you're, in, you're traveling in the same lane as, as vehicles um, on a bicycle. And what, what our plan does is it actually widens it to provide the five foot shoulder. So today, whether if you're coming up five and 10, you at some point in time and along our frontage, you need to be in the traveling with vehicles. And, and there are plain remedies that, and you'd actually have an exclusive lane, exclusive shoulder for bike traffic. So it actually makes it a safer environment, um, you know, for traffic, for bicycle traffic in the area. I, I think it's, it's very difficult to, to look at this plan and all the improvements that, are, that were recommended by the state that have quite frankly been sitting on a shelf for, for years and, and none of them have been implemented. And to say we're gonna add, you know, two to 4% traffic increase the busiest hours of our store's operation, the, the, the busiest times, two to 4%, I mean, that, that quite frankly falls within daily fluctuation of traffic. And, and not, they not look at this and say, this is a much safer plan, not only for vehicular traffic, but for bicycle traffic, and, and, and certainly for traffic coming off the side streets. So, um, you know, we, we've gone back and forth with the state quite a few times looking at this. We've implemented all the measures that, you know, they, they felt fit, and we're, we're confident that this plan is, will make this intersection significantly safer and again, particularly, I, I, re I would recommend that anyone that lives in the area drive out here at night and just look at how dark this intersection is for people, whether you're on a bike or you're, or you're traveling through from the side streets, it's very dark. Just the street light alone, I think, will make this location significantly um, safer for at least half the day. Um, you know, I can, I can certainly give any more detail you'd like, but I think that those are the highlights of the plan that we're proposing. So just to, to kind of close the loop, if I might, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue, um, you know, all of those improvements were not part of our original plan. Uh, and so that's been some of the, I think, benefit of a robust public discussion is we've been pushed and we've gone and pushed, therefore, our respective client uh, and the state to make more improvements. Uh, and that has happened through the process of it. And I think traffic is a good example of the weighing process your bylaw talks about. Um, there, there is going to be, there's going to be increased traffic. It's going to be a little less than a car every two minutes in the peak hour is going to be added to a flow of traffic that totals about 11,000 vehicles a day. That's true. And it's going to have a new access point, a driveway, a driveway which has been relocated at the request of the planning board that doesn't exist today. So that's some detriment. But when you balance it on the scales and you get all these improvements, that have been noted, as Mr. Kelly said, as required for more than 10 years, have no future of happening that we're aware of by initiatives or efforts of the town of Deerfield, have no place on the radar of MassDOT to get those improvements with some drawback of additional traffic, we see that the scale goes in the favor of traffic as to the benefits of the project uh, for the development. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, any other comments, board members? Yeah, yes. David Potter's hand is raised. Yes, David. Yeah, I just want to um, uh, push back a little on Mr. Donahue's uh, description of traffic flow, one car 
every two minutes. I don't think anybody's going to be increasing the traffic for Dollar General along that stretch between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. So, so the traffic flow will be affected uh, during normal daylight traffic times when people are shopping to a much greater degree. Uh, the parking will be, um, you know, impacted to that uh, same degree as people are coming in and out. Um, and the loading has been noted by an expert uh, in front of this board to have presented difficulties that may be then uh, impacting the traffic flow um, outside the store. So um, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, difficult to, to deny that the traffic uh, pattern or the, shall I say, the, the markings and the, um, uh, you know, the way that they're going to increase uh, the, the lanes and, and make it a safer intersection uh, sound to be benefits for sure. Um, but there are other impacts that I think that they're not um, articulating when they say one car every two minutes. If I might, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just, just to respond to that, just to clarify, and thank you, Mr. Potter, for your comments. Two things. Um, the reference I was making to approximately two minutes is, 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 is what I call lawyer math. It's roughing it out. Um, what Mr. Um, Kelly's report indicated is during the peak hour, so the most traffic in any one hour uh, in Route 5 and 10, there'll be an additional 32 to 39 vehicles that will be coming to go to or from Dollar General. Um, and that's the, the, the approximately two minute, just trying to put it in the context. It wasn't looking at a 24 hour uh, scale. Traffic engineers, as was indicated by Ty and Bond's peer review, focused really almost predominantly on peak hour traffic as opposed to the spread that one gets on a 24 hour. And second, I, must, I have to take some uh, a challenge to, to Mr. Potter's comments about deliveries. Deliveries were raised as a question during the public uh, comment uh, and the concern that there was going to be a backup, for lack of it, of vehicles um, um, that were waiting for their turn to unload. Uh, we provided testimony specifically as to the tractor trailer that, and how often that comes. Uh, Mr. Kelly prepared um, a, an exhibit that's part of your um, plan that shows how that vehicle plus another delivery vehicle can both be over in the access point. That leaves the rest of the lot for somebody to essentially queue because obviously Dollar General staff aren't going to be in a position to take multiple levels of deliveries. But for that tractor trailer, for the vast majority of the deliveries are what would simply be daily deliveries. It's bread, it's milk, it's perishables of that nature. Uh, vehicles that you see throughout town, including going to the fairly congested site uh, as far as operations concerned of Cumberland Farms, which this board has previously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denner. Anyone else comments? Any other board members comments? Okay. Um, 5323, adequacy of utilities and other public services. Comments? No comments on that one, anyone? No one? Okay. Uh, 5324, neighborhood characteristics and social structures. Comments? I'm happy to go first if- uh, Yes, go ahead, John. <laughs> Uh, I think this is probably uh, the most uh, difficult or, or trying uh, characteristic that we have to uh, we have to weigh. Um, clearly, the board has heard numerous abutters that uh, that that this does not seem to be consistent with their neighborhood. This this proposal. Um, when, when I look at a neighborhood and, you know, this is somewhat outside my grandparents homes, family neighborhood, which Adam is just a couple doors down. Um, but to be frank with you, the, the land across the street is my grandparents old farmland. So I, I kind of have a, an affinity for, for, for this area, um, that, we have residences, uh, a number of people in the, in, the, in the Mill Village condos. We have a small business, the, the, the fossil and dinosaur place next door. There are several residences across the street. 
and it's the, a retail establishment there, and it wouldn't matter whether it's Dollar General or Walgreens for that matter, is just not consistent with that type of neighborhood. If it was a retail establishment, say like the Atlas Farm Stand, and they wanted to be there, well, they're not over 4,000 square feet, they, it, would, it would be consistent. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of what the benefits and the detriments, I, I see zero benefits for the neighborhood characteristics and significant detriments. Um, I mean, from the views, from the additional traffic. Um, so that's, that's my perspective uh, on, on number four. Okay, thank you, John. Anyone else? Yeah, I, yes, I got a couple things. Um, you know, where they are today versus where they started with the town, they've changed a lot of things to make it a lot better and um, fit the aesthetic appearance. One thing that I'm concerned about is uh, outside sales. They do that at some locations uh, in our retail and commercial area. They, uh, there's not anybody else selling stuff outside from <clears throat> Cumberland Farms right up through uh, to the walk. So that's something that's in, in my mind uh, as a condition. But, um, you know, if you look at the big picture here, um, what they're proposing and it's, and, you know, we've been advised by council, we can't um, discriminate against what could be in there. It's just retail. We have to take that Dollar General sign down and put the Atlas Farm sign up on that building and treat it the same way. And then you have uh, you have to consider um, what could be in front of us if it wasn't this for that same property, uh, and what could go there without coming in front of us for the same property, where planning and uh, zoning has zero input, and you know that goes to the contractor's yard or the um, poultry manufacturing building or something along those lines that are suitable uses that may not even require a special permit. So <clears throat> you got to take all those things into account um, move, moving forward. And, um, you know, I think, I don't know how many questions we're going to get through here tonight, but um, without taking another break, maybe we should uh, consider and in this around 8.30 and then regrouping for next month. That's um, that's where I'm at on that. Do I have a consensus on that? On I see nodding your heads. What part of it? Uh, well, uh, a consensus of, you know, we're not gonna get through this all tonight. So maybe if we, t if we ended it tonight, it, what time is it? Well, you know, and then we could, we'll have a fresh start again. So some of us can get a little bit of rest and be a little more, um, you know, I don't want to make excuses, but some of us are pretty tired. Uh, I'm one of them. I know Adam is, and I think you are too, John. You, you know, this has not been an easy time for us. And not this, but home things with the, with the dealings and the power outages. And we're, we're pretty, uh, we're, I'm kind of shocked. Uh, Bernie. Mr. Chairman, from, from, from the applicant's viewpoint, we're, we're glad to close. We're glad to stop right now, or if you want to go a little bit further, we're, we're glad with coming back. Okay. Uh, that's fine. If I could just, uh, to, the, to the members' comments with regard to outdoor sales, since it was raised, if I could just try to address that very briefly. Um, a, a prohibition as a condition of approval on outside sales, if it, it could carve out... Um, the two components that um, could happen outside, and that's propane, um, individual tank sales. Uh, you've all seen the racks, I'm sure, at stores. And ice is also usually kept outside in a larger cooler because of taking up storage area. But for that, there is no other outdoor sales in, um, intended, and uh, a prohibition would be an acceptable condition of approval. Well, I, I would go further on that on the ice, we made Cumberland Farms put the ice inside. The propane can't go inside because of the um, nature of it. 
but uh, mm -hmm. there could be a suitable side location so it's not visible from the street on the propane, but um, something to think about. Okay. David, Thank you. <laughs> David Potter's hand is raised. Yes, David. Thank you. Um, it's just as long as we're still, oh, I'm sorry, I just raised my hand again. As long as we're, we're on the, con, the, the category of neighborhood character and social structures, um, I wanted to chime in before we decided to close and I'm all in favor of closing soon. Um, but I, I think that it's um, uh, very, very difficult to see any benefit. Um, I'm gonna keep it short, but um, the, the neighborhood character um, is clearly established by what you see and what you feel as you go through that intersection. Um, and uh, it, it, it is in any way that they've put forward as um, um, trying to propose a benefit to us is really mitigating a bad situation. And you know, to say that there's gonna be screens and to say that it's better than something else could be, well, that is not the issue before us. We're here to decide whether this project is more beneficial than detrimental. And I think that in this category, to me, it is an absolute no brainer and there is no perceived benefit um, and only detriment to a greater or lesser degree. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? Okay, John, you, you had a comment? Only Bernie that when you come home your lights will be on. They daren't on the lights on our street. So Oh that's great. Thanks, John. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. Continue the uh, continue the public hearing until the second Thursday in November. I second. And okay. uh, we would have a start time again. Um, it would be November twelfth at uh, six PM if that works for for the, all of us here. Yes, everybody. Sure. Yes, Alex. Alex. Yes, Dave. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, Mr. Costa. Sure. Mr. Costa, sure. you all set with that? Mr. Decker. Sure. The applicant. All right, six. Yeah. Six. Did you say? Six. Yes. I'll okay. restate. Mr. Chair, would you like me to restate the motion? Yes, please. Okay, I make a motion that we. Um, continue the public hearing to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which would be uh, November 12th, the second Thursday in November 2020 with a start time of 6 p.m. And I second it. We have a second. Okay, vote. Um, God. Mr. Decker. Yes. Mr. Decker, you're muted. muted. But it, my question here is, we told the administrative staff that we didn't want to do any other hearings uh, for tonight. Now, I don't know what, what has come in that's going to require a hearing. So you might want to meet earlier than the 6 o'clock if we have anything else on the agenda. I can't. Okay, we'll, we'll check on that. We'll, we'll, we'll continue this hearing, Mr. Decker, till 6 right. p.m., uh, and we'll start this hearing at six. I guess when our meeting is going to be posted, the chairman can decide if we're starting the actual meeting at a different time. We can discuss that after we, uh, after we move on from from this motion. I would say, I have no problem with that. I just want to make sure that there are other people that are looking for things. I assume, and uh, want to make sure we take care of them too. Okay. So, Mr. Sokolowski, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. And um, me, yes. And so John Staberski votes yes. Oh, I'm sorry, John. And I vote yes also. Okay. David so Potter, yes. so, if I can vote, I vote yes too. Okay. Um, so, maybe I can't vote. All right. So it's the motion is passed. So we'll be meeting on um, November 12th at 6 o'clock. Yeah, we'll continue this hearing then. And now I think there's a couple other things on our agenda. Bernie? Yes, we had um, minutes. We had minutes, and there was a question on the minutes. Mr. Decker, would you like to comment on the question? Well, I think in all the meetings where we're on this this remote thing, I think they're all supposed to be roll calls, and so we, we need to make sure that those are all roll calls. 
minutes. Okay. okay. And the other thing is on the hearing relative to uh, Mr. Markowski, uh, I did not participate in that uh, hearing and it should be noted in the minutes. Okay. And the other thing is, uh, did we actually make a finding on the carnies? Because I think technically we were supposed to make sure we had a finding. Okay. I think we, I did, we, I think You're we gonna did. You're going to have to talk about it, but I just think, I just want to make sure that we've done everything we're supposed to do. Uh, I think we signed a uh, paper about the decision, I think. Right. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, we signed it. I just want to make sure we, we did all the paperwork the way we're supposed to do it. Okay. okay. Any other uh, questions or comments by board members? Any information you want to come up with? No, no one? Well, I guess the recommendation would be administratively, Mr. Chair, through you, if there is another um, applicant that needs to be heard, uh, you should poll the board or have Ms. Brulot or Ms. Gannett poll the board to see if other members are available to take those matters up before this hearing or after, or would be the requirement to uh, postpone them off until December. Um, okay but they should make sure that the town hall should make sure they check with the chairman before they start adding things and posting them in the newspaper. That's for sure. Okay. And I think, I, I don't know if we need, I don't think we need to vote on that, but the consensus is I know Mr. Staberski does not get, you know, out of work uh, real early. Uh, I, I just, uh, I like to get some exercise in um, before if I could. So six o'clock start time works works well for me. Uh, I know it doesn't look like I exercise, but I, I do try to get some in. The camera adds a few pounds for sure. That's a good excuse. Great, Adam. <laughs> Will we adjourn? Second it. Bernie, you muted yourself. How could I? Oh, Jesus, yes. Nice talk. You just muted yourself again. No, I'm on. It says. Yeah, you're no, good. Don't touch it. I unmuted you. Oh, you un <laughs> I'm muted. And some people think I'll be muted all the time. Okay. Do I have a, we have a second. We have a second, correct? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to, uh, we have to vote to adjourn, yes? Yes, roll call. Yes, roll call. Okay, roll call to adjourn. David Potter, aye. Okay. Um, Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. Mr. Stowerski. Yes. Mr. Decker. Yes. Uh, Mr. Alex. Yes. <laughs> and Chair, yes. Meeting is adjourned until um, November 12th. November 12th. At 6, 6, 6 p.m. Thank you, gentlemen, for everyone's patience. <laughs>